Welcome to Student TV. I'm Christiana Paris. On today's show, we have a bunch of documentaries to share with you. We hope you enjoy these videos made by our very own Sacramento County student video producers. My name is Anser Williams, and the name of my video is Obama Affordable Care Act. I'm the cameraman, the producer. It would be nice if I make a video and people like really listen and understand it. I hope people learn that when you get the Affordable Care Act, it helps you and your family. The Affordable Care Act was passed by Congress and signed into law by President Obama on March 23, 2010. According to WhiteHouse.gov, the Affordable Care Act gives you better health security by putting in place comprehensive health insurance reforms that to hold companies accountable, lower health costs, guarantee more choice, and enhance the quality care of all Americans. Some of the key parts of the law are as follows. If you have health coverage that you like, you can keep it. Children under 26 can stay on parents' health insurance plan. If you don't have coverage, you can use the new health insurance marketplace to buy a private insurance plan. Starting in 2014, if someone didn't have coverage, they had to pay a fee. If you purchase or join a new plan insurance companies, will be required to provide preventive services like mammograms and colonoscopies without charging co-payment, co-insurance, or deductibles. How has the Affordable Care Act affect you? Personally? Personally. It has affected me personally because it has allowed me to get medical coverage for my children through government assisted programs and just have to pay for myself through my employer. So I don't have to make the decision every month whether I want to pay my health insurance for my family or put groceries in the refrigerator or pay a bill. That's something I don't have to worry about every month. So that's how the Affordable Care Act has helped me out. Do you approve of the Affordable Care Act? I do approve of it because for my situation, it has helped me. For others that I have given care to, it has not helped them so much. It's made it a lot harder to get the services that they should be entitled to. Right. And now they have to jump through more hoops just to get those basic services. So it de really depends on, on the individual situation. How does the Affordable Care Act affect your children? The Affordable Care Act ha affects my minor children by allowing me to have them covered for any medical mishaps. Like, they all three play sports, and because of that, it's a really, really big help because we've had, what, two injuries in two years during the football season. When we were given the question of how an action commissioned by the federal government has affected us and our community, we decided to tackle a subject that directly relates to us as students, the Common Core State Standards. In 2009, the U.S. government announced its Race to the Top initiative, a program that gave a competitive advantage to states who had or planned to adopt college and career ready standards for all students. In response to this, 48 states, two territories, and the District of Columbia chose to adopt the state-led initiative known as the Common Core State Standards. And amongst these states that chose to adopt Common Core is our home, California. According to the Friedman Foundation for Educational Choices Annual Schooling in America survey, nearly 49% of parents are opposed to the Common Core Standards. 
Common Core is the, in essence, it's the ability to take children and teach them the theory of education rather than just the rote learning process. To give them the ability to adapt better to a college world, to adapt to a more basic understanding, a uh, deeper understanding of uh, life in general, of uh, life and work in the workplace. In 2009, the President of the United States went to the Governors Association and asked them to consider our education goals for the United States. From there, the Governors Association, all the governors, um, met up with a whole mathematics coalition. And they were made up of teachers and professors and um, workplace actual professionals. And um, they decided on what should be, what a child needs to be successful in the 21st century. Granted, every plan has its cons. The switch to Common Core may be a difficult adjustment for both teachers and students, since it is a different form of instruction. Some studies show many primary and secondary students are not reading at their grade level. 66% of fourth grade students scored below proficient on the 2013 National Assessment of Educational Progress reading test. Well, I can speak from my own experience. I know that it has really changed my classroom instruction. I've always been a very standards-based teacher, but there were times in the past where I felt like some of the previous standards seemed a little bit random or it didn't seem like all of the skills were things that necessarily were going to have long-term value to all of our students. Perhaps for the students who were going to be English majors and were heading down that path, yes, that was really valuable. I feel like the significant shift that's happened now with Common Core is that the thinking and reading and writing skills are now focused on the skills that all students are going to need in terms of informational text reading and in terms of being able to navigate internet resources in an effective and meaningful way and using you know, the vast you know, wealth of resources on the internet in a way that really helps them understand a concept in depth instead of just having a superficial understanding which I think sometimes can come from internet research. So I think that's really valuable um, and I, I feel like the standards now have a balance that wasn't as strong with the previous set of standards, in my experience, at least as an English teacher. In the end, it is unknown where Common Core will lead us in the future. However, we will eagerly await to see the results, as only time will tell. My grandmother and I find a penny in the floor of the homeless shelter that my family is staying in. Only we don't know that it's a homeless shelter, we think that it's a hotel. A hotel with lots of rats. And I hold this penny in the palm of my hand and it's sticky and rusty, but it feels like I'm holding a fortune. Sacramento, the capital of California. Our quaint town of Elk Grove is just half an hour away in the suburbs of the city. It's not the most urban of areas, so at one quick glance, this city of trees might not make many think of much. But under the surface lies a constant issue. Just 30 years ago, homelessness was predominantly single adults. But due to economic downturns, the variety of homeless has increased due to three factors. The loss of affordable housing and foreclosures, job loss and unemployment, and the closing of housing services. I think that most people don't realize the extent of the number of young people that are homeless. And part of that is because of the way we count them. Uh, part of it is because they're not telling us. But I think it's an incredibly critical problem and challenge that we have here in Sacramento. And frankly, at this point, we're not doing nearly enough about it. 
Initially, a spike in homelessness was concluded as a short-term crisis, but the federal response to homelessness has changed in recent years. A strategy implemented was based on the theory that people experiencing homelessness would progress through a set of interventions that would immediately lead to housing. The reason youth homelessness is a continuing issue is because of poverty in, in the economy. Um, a lot of parents have lost their jobs or don't have jobs, and it's tough to pay your rent or your mortgage if you don't have employment. And also, as far as getting food at the grocery store, having a vehicle, let alone paying for gas, or even riding public transportation. So it's just a whole host of issues. It's been exacerbated by the state of the economy. Uh, I think when you look at the data on this and the statistics, it's gotten exponentially worse. Some of that, I think, is about reporting. But I think just the economy as a whole, as more families have become homeless, certainly more youth have become homeless. There are about 1.3 million poor families right now, including children, that uh, the, the mother is not working and they're also not getting cash benefits. And you know, you have to ask yourself, how do those people actually get by the day? I, I don't think that we have funded enough in homelessness generally for homeless families uh, more specifically and even more specifically for homeless youth. I think one of the reasons the federal government doesn't recognize youth homelessness as being a, a big issue is here in local government on the front lines, we see it day in and day out. And the federal government is up here dealing with a wide variety of issues. It, it's not a key to them. But when I drive down in my city and other cities and I see homeless youth or teens out there on the streets, you know, begging for food, it, it hurts my heart. And we've got to do as much as we can as a community to stop and prevent youth homelessness. In May 2009, Congress enacted the HEARTH Act. This authorized that the United States Interrogancy Council on Homelessness produce a national strategic plan to end homelessness to be presented to Congress and the President. The result is opening doors. The opening doors is a start. Um, that, that's a start to help our youth and give them a place to go and stay. And that's really the most important thing, opening up. But I'll tell you, with the number of shelters we have out there right now, be it privately run or publicly funded, it is inadequate. The Opening Doors Federal Strategic Plan to Prevent and End Homelessness was implemented in 2010 with the vision that no one should experience homelessness, no one should be without a safe, stable place to call home. Overall, I think the federal government is taking more and more of a backseat to local governments about how to deal with problems like that in, in their own communities. Uh, certainly we would love resources to come from the federal government, but I think at the local level we know best about how to deal with the problems and how to solve some of these problems. Um, I think that we, as a community, struggle to support our youth, um, just in general. I think you know it's really difficult when a family is homeless and they try to enroll into the public school. Um, there's a lot of paperwork, a lot of um, things that hold kids back from going into school, especially when they're homeless. For the 2008-2009 school year, public schools reported over 956,000 homeless students were enrolled, a 20% increase from 2007 to 2008. I have experience as a homeless mother and also a homeless youth. Um, I went to several different schools. Um, I actually dropped out pretty, pretty early, probably in the 8th grade. Um, um, having mustard seed in my life was a huge relief lifted off my shoulders because my daughter, who was a preschooler at the time that I was homeless, got to attend mustard seed meant that because I was homeless didn't mean she had to suffer the schoollessness that I, I did when I was younger. I used to be on the board of the Sacramento Children's Home, and I know that pretty much 100% of our kids were failing at school, and a lot of that was because of the broken homes that they came from and the environments that they lived in. So. Being homeless doesn't give you a chance to do your homework. It doesn't give you a safe place. It really makes you think about all the fears and all the challenges that you have making it through the day, rather than, uh, for other kids, really a focus on school and being successful at school. The number of unaccompanied youth experiencing homeless remains unknown. According to 2009 figures from HUD, unaccompanied youths are 2.2% of sheltered homeless population, often leaving home as a result of a severe family conflict such as physical or sexual abuse or escaping foster or institutional care. With homelessness, there's a lot of intersections between um, racism and especially in, in the LGBT population. They're disproportionately represented. Um, 40% of homeless youth are LGBT. 
Research also shows that abuse and neglect affect a youth's behavior and ability to learn. It's through a set of unfortunate circumstances, and it really could happen to anybody. You know, just think if you lost, if your father or mother lost their job and didn't have any resources, where would you be at? So it's very easy to have that shoe be on our foot. So we're fortunate. Although the Opening Doors Act is a step in the right direction, there's still more to do. Little effect has taken place and the results have been spare. The initiative proves that the federal government has not done enough to help with the local governance. The alarming numbers of youth homeless remains undermined. This is the future generation and they can't be left out or forgotten. Let the Opening Doors Act be a starting point, but more instituted if all children are to be safe and secure. Harold, California is a small rural town in southern Sacramento County. It lies just east of Galt and about 20 miles south of Sacramento. With its population of 1,184, Harold has one school, Arcoli, an elementary and middle school that sits across from the Harold Fire Department, and a post office and store round off the center of the Harold town. started off as one of the many small towns surrounding Galt, small towns that lay near the railroad such as Clay Station and Arno. Twin Cities was named because it was the road between Sacramento and Stockton. The road was between or tween these two major cities. With tween changed Place to Station tween. Road was an actual railroad station that had its name derived from the soil which was a mixture of gravel and adobe clay with red room and sandy soil. Probably the most recognizable landmark is the Grove of Eucalyptus Trees. Early in the 1900s, the Sacramento Valley Improvement Company planted farms of these trees and grapes. The company tried to attract people to these parcels by saying the eucalyptus trees were medicinal and could be used to make furniture. They were wrong. Most people found they could not make a living and so moved away. Today, Harold is home to people who seek a quiet existence outside the bustle and noise of a large city.
My name is Aiden Thorpe and my video is Keep Your Paws Off Drugs. We were trying to educate people about the history of drugs and why you shouldn't use them. I think it was a good experience because I got to experience new things and trying the camera and it was just really fun. about Red Ribbon Week before. Well, Red Ribbon Week is a school week or five days celebrated for being drug free or not taking illegal drugs. Thank you. Now I know some information about Red Ribbon Week. You're very welcome. Hi, and when did Red Ribbon Week begin? I'm not sure, Ariana. Let's go ask Rosa. Hey, Rosa, do you know when Red Ribbon Week began? Yes, Red Ribbon Week began February 7, 1985. The story is that Carmena, which was 37 years old and a DA agent, went to go and meet his wife for lunch. Five men appeared at the agent's side and shoved him in a car. One month later, Camarena's body was found in a shallow grave. He had been tortured to death. Within weeks of his death in March of 1985, Camarena's congressman Duncan Hunter and high school friend Henry Lozano launched Camarena's clubs in Imperial Valley, California, Camarena's home. Hundreds of club members pledged to lead drug-free lives to honor the sacrifices made by Camarena and others on behalf of all Americans. Thank, Thank you, Rosa. Now we know all about Red Ribbon Week. You're welcome. People in Sacramento are within driving distance of two historic forts. The first fort is Sutter's Fort, located in Sacramento, and about two hours away is Fort Point in San Francisco. Sutter's Fort was built in 1839 by John Sutter, who was a Swiss settler. He was made a captain in the Mexican army and was given land to establish a settlement in the area. He never had any problems, never really needed any walls. But in, in order to get folks to come to his fort, he put up walls. This not only gave a sense of uh, destination as well as security to f for folks that came to Sutter's Fort, but it also um, gave him a place to lock, up, lock his things up at night. So think of this as the first uh, mall of California. And uh, all these, all the different places that you see around the fort are businesses. Sutter's Fort was near the end of the Siskiyou and California trails, and it served as a waypoint. The pioneers were impressed when they saw cannons at Sutter's Fort. The cannons came from all over the world. Some of them were Spanish. Uh, some of them were from Italy and uh, a lot of them he got uh, off of ships and other captains. The one that's in the West Yard though, the Russian cannon, actually fought against Napoleon's, or the, it's a re re reproduction of a cannon that fought against Napoleon's army. And uh, after the war, the Russians sold those cannons and uh, some of their, the Russian American company was stationed or headquartered at uh, Fort Sitka. And when they made the decision to come down into California in 1812 to open up Fort Ross, they brought four of those with them. And when Sutter bought Fort Ross, he obtained that cannon. Uh, so it was the only field piece in California at that time. All the other cannons that you would have seen in California were either mounted on the backs of wagons or on shipboard carriages. The discovery of gold at Sutter's Mill led to the end of Sutter's Fort. And Sutter owned the fort until 1850, uh, but the fort, uh, the fort was unable to continue because all of his uh, workers decided to leave the fort and go seek their fortune during the uh, gold rush. Fort Point is located underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. It was made to defend against hostile warships.
Well, Fort Point uh, was originally designed as a triangular defense system in the Pacific area here. Um, we have Fort Point here, we also have Alcatraz as a fort before it became a prison, and also Fort Baker directly across the bridge from us, and it was a triangle defense. This is part of the third system fort, so um, you'll see it a lot on the East Bay. And it was built to defend the bay from any invading forces that would want to come in and steal the wealth we were finding during the gold rush. So they started building this wonderful structure in 1853, finished eight short years later on time and on budget. In 1861, just a few weeks before our sister fort and the fort that we're modeled after, Fort Sumter, had a battle. And it was a battle that started a war, and that was the Civil War. Um, the fort itself have about three levels. Um, first floor was the gunpowder room. And then the second floor is the officers, um, commissioned officers' uh, rooms. And the third floor is the non-commissioned officers or the private's uh, barracks. Um, the fort itself has a lot of history. Um, in the local area itself, it was used during Civil War. And um, it was used throughout the different time periods. Um, like during World War II, they used this as a base for the anti-submarine nets out here. They also use it as a staging ground when they were building the Golden Gate Bridge. So this fort is a little bit more than 150 years old now and um, it's definitely part of the local community. If you enjoy history, going to Sutter's Fort or Fort Point is great fun. If you'd like to get your video on Student TV, make sure you enter the SIVAS, Student Educational Video Awards. Entries are due in early March each year. For all the details, please visit secctv.org. Thanks for watching!